Well, it wouldn't be news night without another look at how governments are trying to cope with less in the budget. We're talking about budget cuts and we're talking about, again, the recall. Of course we are. It's news night coming up. And welcome to this edition of News Night. Eric Mansfield has the night off. I'm Ed Esposito, and we're talking about a lot of familiar topics, new updates, and some new topics as well. And we're going to start off with our panelists, a star-studded panel. I could call this the day of the beacon here, because we'll have Phil Trexler in just a couple of minutes. But with us today, Steve Hoffman from the Akron Beacon Journal, and Stephanie Warsmith, also from the Akron Beacon Journal. Uh, let's start off and talk about uh, something that I thought was kind of interesting this week and uh, looking at municipal governments. Uh, for those of you uh, just uh, perusing the newspaper, listening to the radio, or watching television, it was interesting Thursday night, uh, Stowe uh, City Council voted to give itself a 10% pay reduction, also reduce the uh, pay of the mayor. There will be a new mayor, Karen Fritchell, I believe, is uh, barred from term limits, if I'm not mistaken, from running for re-election. Is this kind of a shot across the bow for other cities? Who wants to take this one first? Well, I think it's a, well, I mean, to me, it's a symbolic uh, gesture. Uh, cities need to look and have been looking very, very uh, carefully at uh, cutbacks. They, uh, I don't think anybody knew that the reduction that's coming from Columbus in the local government fund would be quite as uh, drastic uh, as it turned out to be, about a 33% cut in local government funds over the two-year budget period. Uh, I think that took people by surprise. Um, I've said this a million times, I won't go on and on, but the real money, uh, the real savings that's left to get in local government uh, is to be gained by uh, mergers, consolidating services, and that sort of thing. Uh, so it's a nice gesture. If you're running for re-election in Stowe, uh, you can say, I cut the budget, mm -hmm. I, you know, I did my part, right. which, which is fine, but I, I would say that um, I'm not all that familiar with the finances of Stowe. I know they got a problem with the municipal court uh, that's an albatross hanging around their uh, neck, subsidizing that operation. Yeah, Don Rob Robard always has a smile on yeah. his face when he talks about the former Cuyahoga Falls Muni Court. Right, exactly. Right. Anyway, so it's a, a nice gesture, uh, hard work to follow. So, but but don't they kind of have an obligation to do this? I mean, I, mean, I noticed Stephanie and you know all the reporting that uh, all the organizations do uh, on the city of Akron. Probably the first comment you see is, why don't they cut their salaries? Why don't they take furloughs? And actually, they have taken furloughs. They have, and, and I think that people a lot of times forget that. But um, like in, in Akron, which I'm most familiar with, the you know the mayor and his cabinet have have gone without raises. So has council. Um, they haven't actually taken pay reductions, but they have in a way. If you look at furloughs that they've taken, mm -hmm. so and furloughs mean unpaid. Right. So let, let's get that. I mean, that's not a paid vacation where you just get to sit at home. You're not being paid for that day. Exactly. And so I took a look, um, you know, at the the finances in the city. At, well, I have a couple of times and and looked at the salaries, and you actually saw reductions among the cabinet, among you know Pasqualic, and um, among the council. And so you saw that that they had taken a hit. So, but in terms of city councils, they really don't make that much. You know, generally those are part-time jobs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the city of Akron, they make a little bit more than in some of the outlying cities. How much do they make? They make around 30,000. 30, yeah. So, you know, it's, talking about reducing that is not going to get you that much of a savings. But a devil's advocate, Steve and Stephanie, might say, you know, hey, you know, 10% of $30,000 is three grand, and you put that on 10 council people and, and you know, the at-large people and everybody else, you know, sooner or later, you might have some real money. It also depends on what kind of, how the council members uh, as individuals approach their duties. Um, you can spend an awful lot of time on this stuff if you're diligent. Uh, if you're handling constituent calls, uh, even, you know, ward level members right. of council can, mm -hmm. you know. There's a lot of barking dogs and trash that doesn't get picked, picked, picked there, up. There, and there, and yeah. Potholes. 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 Yeah. Yes. And, and so it can be a very time consuming uh, proposition. Uh, you know, the, let's put it this way. Most people who run for local councils, village councils, city councils, county uh, government, uh, we have a county council, um, aren't in it uh, really for the money. It's a, it's a, 
if you approach it with a degree of diligence, it, it's more work than a lot of people think it is. Well, let's talk about uh, how much work it is and uh, how much fun it is to be in public office. It was an interesting <laughs> event uh, this week in Washington, D.C. Uh, at the National Press Club. I thought it was interesting. It was in the First Amendment room where a uh, documentary, and I'm going to use that term loosely because I do want to talk about this coming up, uh, regarding uh, recalls of elected officials was uh, presented. And uh, let's, uh, I if we can, roll to a videotape, a very short clip here of uh, the U.S. Conference of Mayors documentary on why recalls are so horrible. What's going on here? What is happening? In my opinion, it's nothing more than the tyranny of the minority using a very poorly written piece of legislation. It takes your focus out of what we need to be focusing on now, and that's us collaborating as a community. Is this a personal grudge or is this democracy in action? The recall seems to be sort of the newest, you know, instant gratification pill by some of the negative naysayers in the country. I call it recall fever. So certainly no surprise, Mayor Plasquelic appears to be the poster boy for why recalls are bad. Uh, I, I, I said going into that clip there that uh, I, I use the term documentary loosely, and I do because I think it's very much uh, 30 minutes of spin. You watched all 30 minutes, Stephanie. What, what was your reaction to this? Well, you know, I thought it was it was interesting because Akron was was featured so prominently. You know, they were obviously here and and they were filming when uh, when the recall attempt against Mayor Pasquale was going on. So, but I do think that they are coming at this obviously f from the perspective of the mayors, um, not only in Akron but in in several other cities. Um, you know, where they have faced recalls, most of those have not been successful. But there are a few examples like the Miami mayor mm -hmm. who who actually was recalled so but I did think that it was interesting you know the figures that the number of recalls went up from 23 to 57 and that a lot of this is driven by what we have seen uh, you know local state and and federal government which is frustration about uh, the economy and about finances and taxes and and people are reacting to that and they are using new technology that's available to them like the internet and blogs to get their message out steve you had an interesting comment in the beacon journal i mean uh, and i'll play devil's ad now we get to have some fun <laughs> um, uh, i i always thought it was i i always thought it ironic that uh, folks in Akron loved the recall idea when it was Ernie Tarl they wanted to recall, but when it was Don Plasquelic they didn't like it. Uh, you clearly didn't like this recall, it, but, but d does this sort of thing make a compelling argument that recalls are bad? I think uh, the video, the documentary was, uh, I, I use the word recall, it's, the name of the documentary was Recall Fever, mm -hmm. and so uh, I said it was somewhat overheated. I mean, Stephanie's right. This is an organization of mayors, right. and, and they're talking about mayors being targeted. Uh, if if, if you, I could take my tongue out of my cheek, I'd say we would be using a term like propaganda here <laughs> on this. It's a sales piece for why you shouldn't have a recall. I, I, the, there are a couple of things in there, though, I do think that bear watching. Uh, one is that uh, clearly, uh, as Warner Mendenhall made clear in the documentary, uh, he was practically giddy about uh, the use of the internet and uh, I think that the people who drafted uh, charters and who drafted state constitutions never envisioned modern high-tech campaign techniques to gather signatures and to uh, promote your message so the barriers that are written in to uh, most recall uh, provisions are, are fairly low mm -hmm. given are given the uh, skills that are available today, the, given the internet and other techniques that we have today. Um, the other d danger here is that a lot of these recalls, and Akron is still this way, a lot of these recall provisions don't spell out, you don't have to spell out a reason. There's no barrier in that sense. You could just need a general statement of why you want to take the person out. So these recalls tend to be political. Uh, it's just another campaign. And the, I thought it was chilling, the mayor of um, uh, Omaha, I believe it was, who said the, the inter an internet-based recall effort began an hour, an hour after yes. he was elected. Right. Uh, so the danger is... You can't is do much bad in an hour, I don't think. Well, well you have now. He wasn't even in office. Let, let, let's talk about the bad you can do. This is where, of course, our our favorite thing, which <laughs> I hate, I'll admit it on camera. We're going to flip over to the web for so those of you using your uh, laptops at home, follow us now on Newsnight N E W S N I T E dot net.
For more Newsnight content, including extended discussions, full interviews, and the chance to speak your mind about the issues, join us online at Newsnight.net. And for those of you rejoining us on our broadcast portion of Newsnight, hello, I'm Ed Esposito, in for Eric Mansfield today, and want to welcome to our panel Phil Trexler from the Akron Beacon Journal. And uh, let's get things going. We're going to stay in the city hall mode here today because one of the other big stories making the news uh, this week was a decision by a visiting judge who had uh, been a retired judge from Wayne County uh, th that involved uh, the ongoing battle, I would say the battle that never ends now between the FOP and uh, the Plusquelic administration. And this time it's over pay raises. Uh, bring us up to date on this, a real quick snapshot of what the, this seems is a very confusing story. Well, basically, the city was seeking a stay on the contract that the conciliator, the state conciliator, um, you know, approved for the city, or for the union, I should say, and it included contractual pay raises with the first one going into effect this month, and then another one in January, and then another one next summer. And so the city was seeking a stay on that as a part of its appeal of the conciliator's report. The city is continuing to say that they cannot afford to pay these pay raises. The union, of course, says, hey, you know, you've got to pay them. And so the judge this week ruled with the union and denied the city's request for a stay. Now, but the, this, this is a technical issue, the city says. It's not really a yay or nay on whether or not the city can afford to pay it. It's not a right. yes or no on the pay raise itself. It's just whether or not they could get a stay for it. So that means all the police officers can look forward to more money this month, right? Well, that was uh, that is certainly what the union is thinking. The city is saying, look, we've still got this appeal going on on the contract. We're not going to be paying these uh, pay raises this month. How can they do that? Maybe because <laughs> it, the judge specifically right. said no stay. So... The letter of the law, it seems to me, would be, and this is contract law, right? You've gone right. through arbitration, you've gone through a conciliator, this, is, this was supposed to be done, correct? Right, and so I think it'll be interesting to see what, what happens with that. Um, you know, whether, you know, are there any consequences for the city not going forward with this, or will the city um, hold the pay raises, and then if the judge ultimately rules, um, you know, for the union, then the then the raises will go out. What do you put them in an escrow account? <laughs> <laughs> they might have to pay. They actually might have to pay interest on it, go re retroactive and pay interest on it. But also too, this you know, uh, this, this court action here buys the city a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um, the contract I think will last for another 18 months from now, mm -hmm. and uh, then Senate Bill Five, if it survives, you know, kicks in. But you got to remember too is that you know, the city hall is putting the the union. Um, in court, in this forcing the union to spend a lot of money with their attorney to uh, fight not only through the contract, but now you know the appeals that are going through it. So the FOP is is certainly paying for this pay raise. So is that the real strategy, though, of the city? Is is, so. is is this about paying a pay raise, or is this about uh, uh, is this about burying the FOP under banker boxes full of filings and and stall tactics? Uh, to cost the FOP to the point where they can't afford to pay their attorneys. Well, clearly, you know, the FOP has already, I believe, at least once or perhaps twice in the last six, seven months, increased their dues to their members. Uh, I know that they increased them for, to, for Senate Bill 5. Mm -hmm. uh, the FOPs across the state of Ohio were asked to do that, as all were all unions. But certainly, uh, you know, the city wasn't happy with this conciliator's decision, didn't want to pay the pay raises, and they're going to take the uh, union to the wall and uh, fight, these, uh, fight the uh, decision. And in the meantime, it's costing the FOP a lot of money to, you know, to defend it. What, what, wasn't this process supposed to be over by now? They went to an arbitrator. The city didn't like what the arbitrator decided. Then they are or mediator. Then they go to the conciliator. The conciliator. I thought the conciliator's decision was final. And so did the union. What does the law say? I mean, I just, uh, I mean, th 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 this seems to be such a poster child case for both sides of Senate Bill 5. Right, but the city hall has nothing to lose by, by taking this to court. I mean, well, they, they, they got to pay the pay raises. They got to pay the pay raises. Well, but they're, the paying, they're paying legal fees too. I, I mean, mean, this they're is pay, they're paying. They're paying. The city attorneys are already on on staff. Mm -hmm. I mean, they could be. You know, they're already there. They're going to they be paid. They're going to be paid no matter what they argue. Right. You know. Um, so, so what's the resolution of this? Is it just? I mean, is this something that uh, if, if if the mayor doesn't like, or if the FOP doesn't like, what the result of this is? From uh, Judge Brown, does it get tossed up to the Ninth Circuit? Does it go to the state Supreme Court? Does it be, it, you know, is it one of these things that a pay raise isn't decided for two or three years? 
Well, I think that the city sees this, you know, as some, somewhat of a, of a bigger issue because the FOP was the only union that, and actually the only employee group at all because the non-union didn't get any raises. Mm -hmm. um, and they felt, they feel in some ways that the um, police union is, is being rewarded for, you know, kind of digging their heels in and, and fighting here where the unions that didn't, that reached agreements, that took concessions, um, you know, really are kind of being penalized in a way because they sort of played ball and, and mm -hmm. came to the table and, and hashed out agreements. And so I think that that's one of the reasons that the city is, is continuing to fight this because they, um, you know, they think that that is an unfair system. Which but you're almost painting this as being punitive, that the city is going to punish the FOP for standing up and saying, no, we're going to take you through this process. Do you really believe that the city hall would be punitive against the FOP? Absolutely not. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, I mean, you know, th this kind of goes to the, you know, the, the 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 personality and the culture of both organizations, where neither wants to give. But again, getting back to, I thought the conciliator was supposed to have this resolved. It was supposed to be a done deal. Yeah, I, it usually is. And I, Paul Holinsky is talking about there was a signed document that both sides would live by the agreement. Right. And uh, that apparently, I don't know. I, I haven't heard the city hall's response to that, but. Clearly, you don't see these types of appeals go to court on a conciliator's decision. You don't see that often. I don't. You know, I've seen it in personnel decisions, but rarely do you see it in a contract issue. Uh, you know, I, I, I kind of mentioned this a little bit, but this comes at a time when uh, uh, union organized labor around the state, businesses, are girding for what's likely to be a huge battle uh, as early as November uh, over Senate Bill Five. This right. seems to be poster child case. I mean, you could make an argument supporters of Senate Bill Five. Have, you could make an argument that the FOP is an example of labor run amok. Labor can make an argument that this is an example of why Senate Bill 5 ought to be repealed because it shows the bad faith of management. Right, and I think that you know this the police case in Akron has, has been pointed to at times really by both sides during that argument. I know I, I had a discussion with uh, Bill Batchelder, who's the House Speaker, when he was in Akron for an event and was asking him about what was coming up this year. And, and uh, you know, he was talking about how they were going to be taking, a, you know, aim at collective bargaining. This was before the whole Senate Bill 5 battle came up. And they pointed to the police, you know, what happened with the, the police union here and, and that, uh, you know, that is an example of why this process needs to be changed and of course in Senate Bill 5 they have taken the arbitrator and conciliator process out of the negotiations with uh, the public unions. It's going to wrap up our segment on this topic but we do want to note that there are plenty of resources on Newsnight.net. On Newsnight.net we cover a broader range of topics than we can on the air in 27 minutes. Be part of the conversation on our Facebook page and at Newsnight.net. And we want to remind you, of course, you can check our blog on newsnight.net, N-E-W-S-N-I-T-E dot net, and it'll be uh, the erudite writings of Steve Hoffman this week. Thank Congratulations, you. sir. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm looking, for, I'm looking forward to seeing what you do as well. Uh, let's continue our conversation a little bit with politics here. Uh, this week, Kazell Smith, longtime uh, the political figure, county councilman, uh, leaving county council, leaving his position, and taking a job. Uh, with uh, with the county, right? Yeah. Uh, so what's wh what's the deal with this? Why would you leave an elected position to take a uh, to, to to take a bureaucratic position? Christmas came early uh, for <laughs> Gazelle, for Gazelle Smith. You know, the guy's had a, gr a nice career at in county council. Um, you know, done a fine job here, earning I guess maybe twenty thirty grand a year, whatever the councilman made. However, he, he got a nice little gift here um, from the. Uh, Democratic-led county, giving him a job in the, in, that more than doubles his salary, but also sets him up very nicely uh, for his pension because when they go to calculate the pension, they're going to take his top three years of salary mm -hmm. in order to uh, manipulate the numbers. So this certainly boosts his pension the same way it's done for uh, John Pota, who also recently left. Um, <laughs> Is this the kind of stuff? That, this is the kind of stuff that drives taxpayers it, nuts. It, it they, does. they can't and find anyone else to do this job. I, I mean, I'm sure Cazell is, uh, is 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 qualified to do this. But you know, in, in, in an era when people are out of work, you can't find someone who is out of work to I, give this job to. To me, it's it's uh, you know, you have everyone all uh, in Columbus anyway, all wound up uh, via Senate Bill Five. 
about uh, pu public employee uh, benefits, pension benefits, and uh, to me, the, I, I agree, there's a, a certainly uh, much outrage to be generated uh, not by the employees, but by the elected officials themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, this is very common. Mm -hmm. This kind of double dipping, uh, this isn't double dipping, but this gaming of the system. Uh, people who have long years in as elected officials at relatively low salary levels then bumping up. And, and it's, just, it's just gaming the system. But aren't they getting a good employee? Don't they have someone who has the, had the benefit of perhaps seeing a bigger picture or is at least familiar with how things work? That's the argument, sure. Okay. Yeah, you can, you can say that. But the fact remains that he's going he's gonna to spend far more time as a county councilman drawing a large, small salary, mm -hmm. more time in his pension years doing that, but then just you know three or four years in his new position is going to dictate how much he gets in his pension. And that, that's, you know... That, I think that's what uh, you know drives the public crazy. Drives the public yeah. bus on this. Right. Talking about uh, public spending, a uh, big announcement today, uh, this week, uh, in uh, Green, uh, North Canton area, Jackson Township, Lake Township, kind of holding uh, respective breath. Diebold said it was uh, kind of looking to build a new headquarters, had been wooed by Virginia and North Carolina. Uh, Governor Kasich steps into the forefront and uh, rides in, as he did during American Greetings, and says, we're going to keep you here. Uh, this is costing Ohio taxpayers in terms of loans, uh, outright grants, uh, infrastructure improvements, uh, $54 million out of more than $100 million. Now the fight goes to Stark and Summit County communities is to see who gets the rest of the plum. Well, in fairness, uh, conversations have been ongoing. Uh, actually, they started uh, in the Strickland administration. Uh, but I do think Governor Kasich uh, had in his mind another iconic uh, company which did move NCR uh, from the Dayton area, mm -hmm. and I, I moved think to Georgia because they got just an incredible. They got a great deal. deal, and they had a lot of manuf NCR had shifted a lot of its manufacturing uh, out of the Dayton area uh, as well. So I, I think that was on the governor's mind, and uh, you know, unfortunately, in in some respects, I mean, this is a lot of public money. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. Um, unfortunately, this seems to be the way we do things uh, anymore with economic development. Uh, that you get into these bidding wars, and I, I think uh, uh, there was a, a rational calculation looking forward to the kind of payroll uh, that Diebold generates and the kind of jobs that it generates. These are 1,500 high-paid jobs. Yes. These, I mean, this is not, uh, all due respects to my friends at Walmart, this is not an army of blue vests. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and right. these are the kind of jobs that uh, tend to generate um, it's kind of a multiplier effect, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, they're all they're the people that are employed by Diebold, but then Diebold also has contractors, suppliers. You know, a lot of you know, on and on. So, uh, this is a good economic bang for the buck. And it's just you know, like I said, it's just the way we do things. Uh, and unfortunately, what's the alternative? Right. Let them go. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you you can't you know stand by and watch 1,500 jobs leave Ohio. Well, Akron had the same deal with Goodyear, which uh, you know mm -hmm. they're going to start turning dirt on uh, mm -hmm. the, the long way to Goodyear head, headquarters project. You drive down South Main, you certainly see the impact of uh, federal state partnership, uh, the the whole right. deal with uh, Bridgestone Firestone, and and the technical center. You don't have a choice on doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the NCR thing, I mean, you know, you talk to people down in Dayton, that still sticks in their craw. Oh, sure. it was a that was a huge blow. Uh, no doubt about it, and the, I, don't, I think we also have to be careful to some degree not to lose sight of, uh, obviously you want to keep what you have, mm -hmm. especially when it's a Diebold or a Goodyear, uh, but job growth such as it is uh, in this region, in Ohio, and in, in Northeast Ohio, uh, does not come from these uh, uh, big, iconic uh, Corporate it's entities. small business. It's the smaller business. It's the entrepreneur. That's where the job growth is coming from. So you got to be careful to keep uh, uh, feeding the pipeline in that respect too. And the way you feed the pipeline is we did pass a third frontier bond issue to renew the third mm -hmm. frontier. It's those kind of programs that invest in new technologies in smaller entrepreneurial companies that get started in industrial incubators and that sort of thing in university labs and then move on. So you can't lose sight of that. That's a significant uh, investment. Uh, if you don't make that, if you put all your money in keeping uh, your existing uh, big uh, iconic corporations, you're, the danger is you'll neglect the other piece of this. But uh, to, to get back to local going versus local, now it's Stark versus Summit. It really, I, I think that's the unfortunate I mean, part. I thought it was interesting that the mayor of Canton 
was it the announcement? Yeah, I mean, and you I know, think that's the unfortunate part is now you're going to you're pitting all these uh, governments against each other. Who's going to be you know fighting over mm -hmm. over these jobs and the, the tax right. revenue? That's the, the unfortunate part. And I think you're gonna, you're also seeing that with the American Greetings up in mm -hmm. Brooklyn. I mean, clearly it appears that they're there's gonna be a lot leave. of talk they're going out to the west side. They don't want to stay in Brooklyn anymore. Exactly because, because of the right. tax issues over right. there. But but when you're giving all this tax dollars to these companies. I, you just wish there was some sort of caveat there that requires them to stay where they're at and, and to avoid this this poaching of jobs. That, right. That, well, that's the case, on, on the state basis, the Kasich administration says the economic development, the, these grants have been written so that there is some payback if right. the jobs don't stay there. But it's been very tough for local governments sure. uh, to do that. Uh, before we wrap up quickly, uh, Goodyear, uh, the, the East Station, uh, Postal Station, Goodyear Heights is losing their post office, uh, the, the downtown station losing. I think the Goodyear Heights is probably going to have yeah. more impact yeah. than anybody else. Is this just a sign of the times, it's too? It's absolutely, absolutely the sign of the times. I mean, you think about it, it with the Internet, it, it's changing the way that we live, and it's um, changing the way we uh, mail letters. Uh, people uh, pay their bills online. Uh, the, 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 the number of people using the Postal Service is drastically down, and, uh, you know, the... the uh, U.S. Postal Service is talking about cutting Saturday service, making all sorts of cutbacks because they're, you know, billions of dollars, billions of dollars of, of uh, deficit that they're facing there. So um, it's, I think it's unfortunate because, of the, you know, there's some people who have not made the transition to the mm -hmm. Internet and, and they rely on that service, but certainly there's not enough of those people and, you know, the number of customers yeah. are, right. are way down. Yeah, right. and city leaders say that they are going to go and try and fight this, but, uh, we'll, I mean, this is almost like the military base's closing commission. We'll yeah. see it's, how it's that goes. It's odd that you're not going to have a post office downtown. Right. Uh, we're going to cap it off here. Congratulations again to Joe Tate. Uh, this is where things become local. Joe Tate's still going to do some cloverleaf announcing uh, at Lodi and hopefully huh. some Mount Union stuff too. But what a great career in just setting the standard for uh, all sports broadcasters for his work with the Cleveland Cavaliers. And glad to have you here in uh, Newsnight territory, Joe. Congratulations again. For Eric Mansfield, Steve Hoffman, Phil Trexler, Stephanie Warsmith, I'm Ed Esposito.